Welcome to the Lost Signals Discusses Literature, where we apply the revolutionary mutt skill to classic and contemporary works of prose. So, join us once again, won't you? Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Lost Signals Reviews Literature. Today is going to be the second part of our dive into killing stalking. We might not have come back to this, but a viewer requested, uh, asked us if we were going to do the rest of the series. So here we are delving almost as uh, we are uh, slaves to our uh, viewers. So, if you ask uh, it, we will do it. Yeah. So uh, I'm Jonathan Ian Manser here with Stephen Ramosi. Hey, here with both eyes. Christopher Morgan. Good evening. And uh, Scott Thurlow. And I am not in danger of being killed or stalked because I've been living in uh, cooped up on my house for two weeks because of the snow. So, no unlike fear. Steve-O, whose picture looks like he's about to be murdered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, uh, we decided to do the next 10 episodes or, uh, or finish off the first season of Game yep. uh, So, last time we were dealing with uh, which of these names? We looked them up, but I'm still going to butcher them. Uh, Sangu and Bum. Bum is a frail, weak uh, man who he falls in love with Sangu, who's kind of an alpha male prototype, uh, breaks into his house, only to find out that Sangu is a serial killer. He gets trapped there. Uh, they get into a very strange relationship, uh, for, to put it mildly. To say the least, yes, exactly. And the first, uh, the first. Ten that we did ended with uh, Sangu picking up a uh, creepy old man at a gay bar and bringing him home to give uh, Bum the first taste in murder. In this episode, we're dealing with uh, the continued... Uh, so there's a cop that occasionally appears, uh, appeared in the first uh, uh, ten. And the fr- uh, first couple of uh, trades or uh, um, issues, basically, yeah. Issues, yeah. Uh, follow chapters. Uh, He's basically uh, Detective Angel from uh, um, uh, Hot Fuzz. <laughs> it's a uh, big city detective who gets transferred out to the rural uh, uh, thing, uh, but his big city uh, detective skills uh, are, are triggered by uh, Sangu. It's tingling. Yeah. So he starts investigating, but doesn't find anything, but his suspicions are raised. And then it goes into the detailing the daily lives of uh, Bum and Sengu. Uh, Sengu decides to bring Bum out uh, so he can watch him sing at a local college event. I don't know if it's more like a high school. Because it's like a talent show, it, it seemed to me. Like yeah, the yeah. college is yeah, putting on a show. I believe college in other cultures is uh, different than how we in America view college, but I think they're supposed to be younger than I imagine them to be. And... Um, uh, uh, basically, in order to uh, take a pretty young lady and bring her back, in order for to be Bum's second victim, mm-hmm. she's not supposed to be the same person that he's like uh, telling, like flashbacking about. No, no. I think the point point is sorry. Like to enter that, Steve. Like we'll get into it, but I think in order to sort of psych himself up, if you will, to enact the murder, to please. Uh, Song Wu, he envisions her as that, uh, his former class from like middle school. But I also think that, uh, so, oh, I guess we'll talk about that now, is that I believe from the rest of the series is really exploring uh, partly one of the things it's doing is how our past tragedies inform our current uh, decisions. Uh, and the fact that monsters are born out of uh, uh the negative feelings that you have of rejection and uh, and that, that bum while not be by uh, a weird guy was not violent until presented an opportunity to enact on his past traumas. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. But unless uh, I want to go like I did last time, this is going to be more of a free form discussion. We're not quite reviewing it per se, uh, but yeah. Uh, I was fascinated. I read this a lot when I was in grad school. I'm no longer in grad school, so I kind of dropped off of it. Perhaps that says something about my psychology in grad school. Your own traumas. 
but uh, I, I, I have, this is probably my second time reading through, if not third time reading through this. And it was difficult to actually get through emotionally, especially in the latter scenes of dealing with uh, Bum's uh, flashback and his awkwardness and pain because it very reminiscent in my youth. Uh, and maybe I would have become a bum in a certain circumstance, and maybe I would have become a sang in a certain circumstance instead of becoming that awkward detective in real life. Anyway, uh, that's my general impression to start out with. What do you guys think? So you asked me this precast, so I guess I'll answer it here. You said, uh, you know, did you like this one more, or like what you said, like your general impressions? And my answer to that was, and I'll say uh, again here, is that. I guess because we had read the first 10, so you're familiar with this work and, uh, you know, beforehand, before we did the first part. So now, like, because the first 10, the first half of the first season, if you will, is like, I want to say it's all set up, but it's a lot of setup, of course, because I need to introduce the characters and then the dynamic and what's happening. So now that that, like, groundwork is in place for me, like, I think I enjoyed this one just a little bit better because there was no, like... It already been established, right? So now it's like, oh, what's gonna happen next? Like, you know, how's he, how's this like weird, fucked up, like dark relationship gonna unfold, and what they're, you know, what the changing dynamics are gonna be with it, and what Sang Wu is like, you know, uh, messing with uh, Bum is going to be. So I think I enjoyed it uh, in that sense better, just because I had already a grounding, and now it's like the next part, right? It's almost like a ser- like literally a serial, like a TV show or something would be, in that sense. So. I think that's my like impression. Like, if I had to rate it, like, not even on our scaring thing, just maybe we should have read it all together. Maybe it's the way we read it, even that's part of it. But you know, it's like you binge the first part and then the second part. So yeah, like I think it was a good way to um, keep the story going and forward it and again uh, raise the stakes, I guess, which is an important part of it. So I, I quite enjoyed it, even though, of course, yes, it gets dark and graphic and disturbing. But that's sort of the whole point, as we talked out a bit in the first part. So. What do you boys think? Uh, it's interesting. I think it's like I, I, it splits up very evenly in these two way in these mm. two first ten and then the eleven through nineteen or whatever. In so far as it's basically the same thing again. I mean, like not the whole like you said they set up a lot of groundwork in the first part, but like it's really just ramping up to the same thing happening again at the end of the at the end of this. You know. I was reading it and yeah, it's, it is like, it definitely is emotional uh, and like disturbingly uh, it, it, it is disturbing uh, as you read, like Certainly. about it, as you were mentioning Ian, it's, it's tough to get through at parts, but like it seemed like it was just kind of the, a similar arc over again. And like you said, you like this one a little bit more, Scott, Maybe it was a little bit better, but I wasn't like as interested this time as I was in the first the first time. Um, so I don't know. That's just my initial thoughts on it. If yeah, okay, I'll just if you don't mind, I'll just just that. Maybe it's be it sort of leads up to the same like I guess general basic plot beats, but I think because the emotional stakes are as I said are higher now. Like yeah, it's his second kill, and he's sort of like. For Bun, that is like, you know, a la Sangu's prodding. I think that means like he sort of, it's like he finds himself in a sense, or at least gets more into it, which is one of the most disturbing, more disturbing parts of it. But I think that wouldn't be as impactful were it not for the first, you know, the earlier, the first half of this. So that's well, all, Steve. Yeah, sure. It's like the, the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, it's just getting more, and more like, yeah, he's just getting more and more. Building this violent character, basically, in his basement. But um, anyway, I, I don't want to say more. Chris, go ahead. Um, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I reread the end of the first season to kind of get back into the rhythm. And it really, it, it's weird because I feel like this was more exposition heavy insofar as, all right, we gave you the first 10 that would kind of like be a prologue, set the stage, now we're starting to focus in on a bigger story. It's just like this. I mean, to your point, Scott, I mean, you know, this, it's kind of hard to judge this um, compared to the uh, first half of the first season, because first half of the first season, I feel like we got a story arc plus, you know, mid season finale fodder. Um, 
And at the end, so when we get into the second part, I feel like, you know, it took a while for it to come back. I to what you mean. The, the whole, yeah, they had to set the stage in so many stages. Give you some more exposition to get to the, to get so that the first kill, uh, there was a payoff for that. And you could see uh, what's happening to Bum. And as I think uh, Ian said, you know, kind of like taking past trauma and manifesting it. Um, you know, so it's it's kind of like, you know, it's a, is this something that was always in him? Or is it something that, um, you know, he learned into as a matter of survival? Was it both? Um, they're interesting character studies there. I, I hate to be redundant, but they are. It is not an easy read, but by the same token, you, uh, I, I, find, I, I, find, I find the pacing's really good. Once I got like my feet, you know, cemented into where we were right now, that it was going to be like a slower paced storytelling. Um, you know, I thought, you know, it was one of those things where I just wanted to read more. And I don't think it's uh Schadenfreuden. Is that where you're taking pleasure at the misery of others? It's not like that. It's, it's, it, it's weird. I have complicated feelings on these because I, I start reading this thing and I fly through it. Cause I want to know what happens next. But by the same token, you know, I think I think taking it as a character study, and I know this has come up with me a couple times fairly recently, but like if you take a look at it as a character study, it's not that it sort of it, it's not that it um, takes away from the um, the horror, for lack of a better word, elements of it, but it kind of gives context to it in a very it's it's well I can see this as a very well constructed piece. Um, so to me, it's kind of hard because I feel like we've gotten one little section of a story as kind of a complete story. So, but as far as like a follow-up to, you know, like what Scott says, it's like, all right, it makes me want to read more. It's a natural follow-up to everything we had seen up until now. So there, I, I wanted to jump in that uh, conversation that you, you and Scott, uh, Steve and Scott had earlier. And then I wanted Chris to go though, but the big difference between this one and the first kill is that the initial kill, the man was not a, not say he's a bad character, but he was a kind of a morally gray slash, I guess, culturally uh, deplorable character. Seedier. The older man trolling a gay bar for young boys. Uh, nothing wrong with that, but in society, it's one of those things that are easier to stomach in a horror sense uh, for a death. There's almost that kind of like societal punishment that wants to go into that kind of thing, as a horror often demonstrates. Mm. In this one, yeah, you kind of had that to a certain extent with having the stuck-up uh, young woman. However, you it deals with quite a bit of her internal monologue as well. So you see her as insecure. You see her as no different than uh, Bum and In a lot of ways. Yeah. Imagine Zangu's Sang internal monologues like as well. And the idea is that she's being punished for hip hypocrisy, uh, even though she's as insecure as Bum, Bum is. She needs to view him as a lesser individual. So yeah, she she goes down that uh, She's, she's oh, the where the original character was a worthy victim in that sense, or uh, or uh, in horror movie standards, she is still as well, but less so. And also, the big difference is Bum is an active participant in this murder, versus being, I think, legitimately pushed into it in the first one. Literally, yeah. I think that's what I yeah I was. Thank you for mentioning that. Like, I think that's one of the big. Uh, thematic differences here and like like you said chris character study moments where <clears throat> i just thought of that as you were speaking like yeah at the end of he almost like saying almost like basically is holding his hand moving him forward whereas this it's all bum he's sort of taking his earlier childhood trauma and focusing it to like like i said like <clears throat> built himself up to be able to stab jen like 12 times or whatever it was and a very horrifying scene but i think that's the turning point at least one of them a, a of a map of them, if you will, in the character to your point, Chris. So, sure. So, in the initial uh, 
episode, I believe I brought up the comparison to Hannibal, which is one of my favorite uh, TV shows of all time. And I actually, I feel it's a similar dynamic, is still growing in this of Bum, both being under control of Sangu, but also wanting to break free from it. And him attempting to tell people that he's a prisoner. <laughs> Get away from me, kid. You're bothering me. <laughs> yeah. I, you creep. Move away. What are you talking about? I, I'm kidnapped. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I think that was a very powerful scene. Yeah, no, I agree. Like it's it's sort of co- like uh, crescendo is the word I want, right? So like sort of builds up in there, starts building up, and like the crescendo, of course, happens when he channels his earlier trauma from another like former classmate from earlier. I it, I guess from my guy, they're like correct me if I'm wrong. It was when he was like maybe like in sixth, seventh grade, like something like that. Like that he's like it's that's I get the sense of that was his encounter with oh you know, that. A, a girl a classmate of his at that time, which he then uses to channel his rage and again force himself like m- much more freely of his own free will to enact the murder in at the end of this one. But I guess I, I want to go back real quick to something else because I meant to say this. I guess if I have one like complaint or nitpick, is it's like I understand like I know it's part of stories like this. It's a not a cliche. It's it's a trope that you sort of have to have. But I was the most bored or least interested by the cop part. But I know you have to introduce the cop like to be there i understand that and i'm sure it comes back later now e you've read everything if not mo- uh, most of it if not the rest of it you said a couple of times i have not read killing stalking i've only read it for the podcast so i don't know what happens but i i imagine i can probably guess a little bit at least it's just that i i, I understand mechanically why that character and that arc has to be there but i was like all right cool but let's get back to you know the, i think the main core characters in relationship so i would agree that i think that they overplayed the detective i think it could have been more limited and still got on the same point across that's all. yeah that seemed like uh just a how many was he more than one chapter he yes. i think chapters? he was in the first and then a little bit of the second or comes back in like two or three no, it's the three first movies. i think it's the exact it's the first, first two chapters of him the it just seemed like him being in that house seemed like really overwrought and like over over long. Uh, I guess they were trying to play on the tension of like the scene, but yeah, I mean that is what it, it was, Steve. At least that's what I got. But it go just on. didn't super work for me. And then um, I did, you know, there there is like this interesting uh, arc where they go out to the. Um, restaurant and the show and all that stuff oh, that was a good scene and and all and all that interaction with the outside world and and uh bum trying to figure out like whether or not he wants to like say something and then finally doing it it seemed a little bit um i don't know what the right word for it is like it seemed like a little bit much when he was like i'm kidnapped and they like push him over like get out of my way kid like, you drunk like, idiot what are you talking about a like, bit unrealistic to me but <laughs> Whatever. I guess it's the story beat that they needed in there or whatever. I also think that it, the way I imagine it's like heavy music playing. They yeah. can't hear each other. It's a club's kind of scene. Uh, he's trying to scream over, like, but he's meek, so he's probably mumbling a lot of the words. Yeah, yeah, I visually interpret Exactly. Trying to enjoy a show in the college hall, and his kid's like, they're like, what? Again, everyone just assumes he's drunk. They're like, get out of here, right? Yeah. Uh, we locked the doors. I, I'm in prison. You're, you're saying that I imprisoned you? Get, get the hell out of here, you drunk. <laughs> so that's how I kind of... Uh, uh, but I also just want to bring it to a point you guys made, is that I, I, I think uh, the detective thing is... If you view this as the first tw- uh, 19 episodes as one piece of work, the detective's actually the diffusal of tension built from the murder of the gay man. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Like, it, so I guess it, it's yeah. awkward as the start, an introductory chapter, but it's not meant to be. It's meant to be. We have the uh, the kill. Now let's calm down with the detective a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I guess maybe it's because of the way we sort of artificially chose to break it up. Like maybe that's why it comes off or feels like that to us. Like that is a very good point. Like taken as a whole, it probably does serve that purpose. Like I can see it serving that, and it makes a lot more sense. You know, viewed as such. Um, I, I found it like that point. What I find interesting about this is they seem to create a mess and then kind of reconstruct it. So because they keep having this thing, this codependency thing where it's a pull, you, pull me in, push you away. 
um, little stunts that he like like that in the in the, um, in the um, concert hall. It's called, for lack of a better word, the talent show. Which again, I agree with you. It's a, probably a loud, noisy place, and we've all been to shows where some drunk person tries to talk to us, and you're like, I don't care, you know, um, get away from me. I'm trying to enjoy the show. Um, but it's just it's it's the it's what he did um, to kind of help um, continue to antagonize Bum. You know, he it's just like, hi, come and see me in all my glory. And then Bum's having that moment, like, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. And he, like, flaunts this woman in front of him. And, exactly. Yeah. You know, it's part of the reason. It's not just her. It's him kind of ridiculing him as well. He was just trying to the, – the, the, the levels of manipulation here are – and I don't mean to mitigate any of the horror, um, but it, it is very fascinating, you know, from somebody – who knows a lot of therapists, and knows a lot of, um, you know, psychology and so forth. I guess that's part of the thing. It's just like these little mechanisms of codependency that are, yeah, definitely more extreme in here. I'm, you know, it's, I don't know. I, I, I found, I'm really interested in seeing where this goes, even though I read the first chapter of the next um, series and I can't remember you know exactly when it is. So I'm going to keep my mouth shut for anything. I'm not sure if it's in the next season or not. Last thing is that that's why I think this resonates with me as a work is an exploration of, even though heightened for dramatic effect, uh, perhaps not even, I'm sure these kind of direct relationships of vi very violent people and abuse really exists. But the idea of just an exploration of how someone can get control over another person like this and how I see the thing is, I think one of the beauties of this work so far is that Bum always makes the choice to stay, even when he has the realization not to. And, and I believe that he wants to get the hell out of there, and I believe that he wants to stay. And watching Sengu play with him in such a manner of, uh, like, for instance, gaslighting him and accusing him of attempting to make him uh, jealous. <laughs> uh, like, I thought it was a great, like, that's such a fucked up power move of forcing him to hold guilt over something you were just doing. I, it, 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 it's beautifully screwed up. But the thing is, I, I also don't think this is ever a glorification of that. It's, it's meant to be a horror story about something that, regularly happens in society of abusive controlling relationships. Yeah. And the, and the fact where people are going to, a person or people will ask for control, whether it's like, you know, you have somebody manipulating the situation where you're asking for that personal control or whether you're talking about a mob, mad popular uh, mass populist where somebody plays upon your fears and then gets you to maybe ask for a, a second Patriot act or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's delving into that, um, is delving into that core of the human psyche. And yes, I brought up current events because I'm vehemently opposed to that, but yeah, it's yeah, the same, but, but the psychology is the same. Same idea. Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think that, you know, you're, it, it absolutely is trying to explore that power dynamic and how it works and, and the, um, the, I guess, code, like as, as you said, Chris, like codependency, issues in a um just an abusive relationship and and yeah it is it is um i think it does a good job of describing uh bums feelings of you know uh, uh, how he's feeling as this is going on like you said like i do i think you're right i I believe it that he wants to leave and I believe it that he wants to stay. Um, and he's trying to really, and he's really struggling with both of those. Um, and we don't really get a ton of like what's going on in uh, Samu's head. Um, but I don't think I, like, I honestly, I don't think that's a, really a problem of the, of the story. I think it's a narrative choice that, you know, Oh, actually I was going to see his manipulation of every situation is Sangu's voice. Yeah, that's good, Chris. I, I like that. 
yeah, so, I guess yeah. so. But I, I think that certainly, um, you know, not not that he's not making the choice to act like this, but certainly a lot of that is just um, instinct to him. I think at this point, mm-hmm. second nature. That's how he treats people in relationships. It's very obvious from like the outset. So, yeah. I, you know, it, there's a lot of that um, discussion of that stuff going on in this. And yeah. now I want to bring up something that's not like maybe more mechanical again. So we addressed it in the uh, the first episode. So in case you haven't listened to that or just checking out this one. Now, the format of Killing and Stalking, I think is interesting. Is one of the things you we talked about, E, that you want to focus on. So I still read it on my computer, my PC screen. However, it is indeed uh, more meant to be sort of scrolled through. Like it goes top to bottom. It's not, it's not traditionally uh, structured uh, in, a, in a way that you might think of as a manga or comic, you know, normally would be like any other random one, right? And since we just did Understanding Comics, Steve, I thought you might find that interesting that it's specifically made for a modern, uh, you know, technological device format where you could just scroll easily. It's sort of concise, compact, and it's meant to be like sort of, not taken in fast per se, but just specifically geared to be read in that format. So, did you guys read it on your phone or not? No, I did. I I I'm giving all my money because I enjoyed this work quite a bit to the uh, the the original format this was intended to be in. Um, or I did once upon a time. Uh, the what what's cool is that I think it's a nice melding of film and but also making you an active participant, which was comic does very well. So you have the scrollability where it's fluid. Yeah. So it's not the choice of turning the page, but it's the choice of, in a sense, unpausing it mm-hmm. and allowing it to flow. So it stops a little bit of the guilt of being forced to, if I turn this page, this person dies. It, but it still makes you complicit. And I would say that's very much uh, attaches you to kind of Bum's world in this, is that he is kind of trapped in the flow of Sengu. But that might be reading a little bit too much into it. No, I mean, I kind of like, that's what I was sort of like, sort of leading at, or at least I, I feel as if the intent we discussed before, and I want to bring it up, that's why I brought it up again here, is that it's designed, like, again, artistically, specifically for that so that there is that little sort of complicity if you will like on the part of the reader right of the audience because of the way in which it's meant to be taken in like even reading on a computer screen you still have to do it right now it's not like does that exact one-to-one but since it's again um being produced uh a la sort of some of scott mcleod's uh theories right steve like ideas uh in a in a medium within a different medium or at least a uh Again, device that is much different from reading it uh, on a physical page or you know something else like that. I just thought that's a very cool sort of. It can create a interest that could be unnerving, but I think that's, of course, part of the point of it. So, um, I didn't read it on on my phone. I I don't think that I could read a comic on a phone. I, I've tried before, and it just doesn't. I don't like it. Even one made specifically to do so. I don't know. <laughs> well, it's just too small. Um, so I read it on my computer. I, maybe on a tablet would work probably pretty well. Um, but I, I read it on my computer just like you and, um, but you know, I think, I think it works fairly similarly. I know it's not like a touchscreen slide, but like it does, it is like very obviously created to have that, um, be like fairly minimal within each quote unquote panel, uh, and be very, open like the panels are very open to the next panels um, yeah exactly. if you can even call them panels right like uh i think i would the, the, the which is designed obviously just to just to keep a flow going and and i think it's like really well done in terms of that like mechanically if we're talking about that yeah it's yeah. you know mcleod had this uh what was it infinite canvas idea uh which this isn't quite that but um it kind of plays with some of the ideas that uh he was really interested in touches upon for a while so uh yeah i mean mechanically it's it's a really fascinating thing i I think that there are more like web comics these days that are doing this type of thing but 
Um, I haven't read a ton of webcomics lately. I used to read more. Um, but I've been mostly doing just trades and stuff like that. Hard, I'm, hard I'm, I mean, I wouldn't even know how you'd even put this in a book form. Even going, like, even if you did it, had a, you had to like turn your vertical book horizontal um, because there is so much white negative space. Like there's so much like well, the gutter you know, is traditional. one page could basically be one word in a bubble in a, in a blank page, essentially. Um, I think the scrolling format is, yeah, it does make it's complicit, but it kind of like alleviates some of the guilt just because you get caught up in the flow of it. Um, and it, I, I want to just concur with you guys aesthetically. It's an, it's an incredible choice for any kind of narrative. Yeah, I think that might be like one of the most interesting parts. I'm sorry, he was who's the author? She has like one name or it goes by like Coogie. one name, Coogie. Oh. Coogie. Yes. K-O-G-I. Yeah, I just thank yeah. you. I just want to say like I think that's a fascinating choice, like and way to do this comic, like this story, uh using that as a sort of like extra layer upon it. So for that effect. Uh and and just before we go on, since you asked the question, Chris, um I read another comic. Actually, this is one of the other web comics that I read, but um called Firelight Isle, which is done in like scroll form. So it's similar, um, like scroll as in like a scrolly roll up. So like right. a biblical scroll. The something. book, as, what is, as you're describing, like what you're describing, kind of like you open it, read it from, you know, the, the side of the cover on a normal book to the other, to down the bottom. But um, he actually, uh, uh, Paul Duffield, who does Firelight Isle, actually put out a scroll that you can buy. Like a little a, roll scroll, yeah. yeah. Sweet. And you can like unscroll the whole thing and read the whole thing. It's like 20 feet long or whatever, done on like cloth and, and ink and shit. <laughs> it looks awesome. Nice. It's really it cool. a little bit pricier than I wanted to go because uh, it's a fucking scroll. It's sure. awesome, but uh, sure. yeah. I did buy some of the printed trades and uh, they didn't make them in English. So I didn't know that time, so I bought a bunch of German Comics. <laughs> nice. I like to add a man. I don't know if you, since you watched, read a different version than me, I don't know if you got the extra uh, parts of it. So you the, mean the things that kind of like translate some of the subtext? No, no there's some no. like saying like I omitted this because it doesn't make any sense in English. No, I think those are like it's editors. I think notes, it's I like think. Um, translators notes. Crowdsource translators on yes. this on the one that we're reading because some of them were much worse than others. Um, uh, there was an inclusion of mine of uh, uh, alternate realities where uh, where all the main characters are working different jobs. Yeah, that was part of it. I thought that was like a little like break special. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know what's included in uh, on your copies. The yeah. But uh, I, I really like the one where uh, Bum is making the observation about how people dress <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, when they're out on dates to depend <laughs> who likes the other better. I actually remember... Uh, uh, because when I read this, uh, it was pre-COVID the first time. So I would actually go out when we were going out to bars and see if I could <laughs> actually notice that difference between how people uh, dress or not. Uh, I don't think I came up with any conclusions on that, but I thought that was interesting. Yeah, it's a little, interesting little touch for sure. But yeah, yeah. That, that, that little part was included, at least in the version. In the, uh, we're but they from. also had in, this was a episode where uh, she was talked to her audience and brought up all the fan art oh that one i didn't know that was yeah. not included that's cool uh including cosplayers and this was concurrent with her finishing the first mm. uh, um season of this so mm. interesting people and from all around the world different groups who and it's interesting i want uh, who identify with sangu who identify with bum uh and that I mean, there's been controversy over people viewing this. I, we mentioned this last time as a romance versus like a psychological discussion. And I just think that if art that speaks to people, uh, especially if you're, uh, uh, I, I sang it was an easy power fantasy to have. Uh, Bob is an easy person to identify with if you're feeling very depressed. Um, and also, as, if we do continue doing these, uh, we'll see bum get some more agency going forward but um which i think is the expe- expectation it does subvert it a little bit but um yeah. uh, it, it is the going to the depths of a bad situation and a, a coming out of it which i think is a necessary kind of coda to this a work like this yeah. hey ian you yeah. you said you bought your digital comic yes 
All right. I, I know personally I'd like the link of that because I'm enjoying this enough that I, I'd be willing to confront it. But maybe it's also something we should post as well. Because uh, yeah. I, I, we'll, we'll I, put it I, up I there. I looked it up, but uh, it started playing. Uh, uh, Killing me softly? Please no, tell me. Uh, 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 um, Rolling Stones are useful idiots, so I didn't want to start interrupting this political nonsense. Yeah, no, very no, nice. But nonetheless, I. Um, does anyone have any other thoughts, or sh- shall I put this episode to a close? No, I think it's a good closing off part because, again, it's just the next 10. And I, I certainly, like like you, Chris, like I guess, Steve, oh, you're the least like interested in reading with it whether fan request or not like it's sort of like is fortuitous that we were, we were asked like hey are you going to do more and we have now and yeah like I, I think it is a fascinating piece of art like you said e like however it resonates in whatever way like it's an interesting i think m- modern way of doing a story like this and i find that i think the most uh fascinating part about it so yeah i mean i i before we started this episode i kind of said like hey I'm happy to I'm happy to do the rest of this if if that's what we end up doing. But it, without the podcast, I probably wouldn't read any more of this. It's not really sure. my type of story. Gotcha. Um, but you know, it's it is interesting enough to. I mean, I'm not going to complain if we keep doing it. So, um, let's uh, let's see where we, we, we need to see if the detective figures out the mystery. Yeah, I, I was gonna, <laughs> I was going to say uh, to you know, that they are working on a bigger story now. We had the prologue and like, uh, for, you know, for better or worse, I'm sold on it. Um, so, you know, I'm down to keep doing this, to see this through the end. Cause I'm going to read it one way or another and talking about it. And, you know, thank you to, to whoever requested this. Um, I'm going to be pushing for more. Sure. Okay. I'm down. I don't think you're going to have to push too hard. I don't know. Well, you know, <laughs> Just decided to be a little dry. Three of you yeah. definitely want to do it. I was going to say, Steve, if you don't read anymore, we'll kill you. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I was going to say, we're going to break your legs and give you to a basement. You read <laughs> sure. Yeah. That too. That sounds like a lot of work. So uh, yeah, that, yeah, that sounds like an awful lot of work. I wouldn't want to deal with that. <laughs> you will have to cook too. I'm Jonathan Ian Manser, and this has been uh, finishing the first episode or season of uh, Killing Stalking. I'm here with Stephen Amosi. See you later. Christopher Morgan, stay safe. It's got the Yeah, the happy, safe, and consensual Valentine's Day. Thanks for joining us. Oh, yeah. I'm done. Oh, I'll see you next time. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>